Thanks for joining us. This is the latest in the LiDAR webcast series. Um, today we're going to be talking about gridding LiDAR data. Uh, my name is Katrina Schweiker. I'm an application specialist here at Blue Marble Geographics and I'm joined today by my colleague David McKittrick. Thank you Katrina and thank you all for uh, uh, spending time with us today and learning a little bit more about the Global Mapper LiDAR module. Um, as Katrina indicated, we're going to be focusing today on the process of generating a DTM, digital terrain model, and we'll also take a look at the variant, the digital surface model. Uh, very quick look at our agenda today, obviously very focused. Um, first of all, before we get too deep into the, uh, the procedure, we need to define exactly what it is we're doing. So we'll define the process of gridding. This is essentially a transformation process from points to a surface. Uh, we will talk a little bit about this, some of the filtering options. This is by way of recapping some of the content that we would have covered in the second of our presentations, maybe the third, I can't remember exactly which one, but one of our previous presentations, we dedicated that uh, um, section to talking about filtering options. They do become relevant now that we're actually processing the data to maybe go back and look at some of those filtering options. Um, there are two procedures that we can follow when it comes to that transformation process. One called triangulation, the other based on a binning process. And Katrina is going to explain to us all exactly what the difference between those two are and the benefits uh, of using one over the other, the, the consequences of using one over the other. Um, we will spend most of our time going through the various options, uh, the gridding options and the, the variations on the theme of gridding. Brand new, as of a few weeks ago, uh, with the version 18.2 release of Global Mapper, we now have a new tool, a new option that's enabled with the LiDAR module in our gridding process, and that's a hydro flattening process. Now, if you're if you're watching this video before uh, the end of July, you're probably getting a sneak peek. We actually will formally introduce this application in our next live presentation, but we'll give you a little sneak peek of this one specific function today. And to wrap up today, we'll take a little bit of time talking about some of the visualization options when working with terrain, some of the shaders. On the left side of my screen here, you'll see that we've created a representation of the terrain that is based on a color pattern. This is our Atlas shader with shades of blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. There are variations pre-configured in Global Mapper. There are also customization options. And we'll take a little bit of time to look at some of those options. So today we're going to be spending some time on a very nice little town along the coast of Maine. I think it's about an hour and a half drive mm -hmm. east of here. A um, little bit uh, closer as a crow flies, Maine's coastline, as you may be familiar, is a very inundated coastline. So uh, while it may seem close on the map, it actually takes a while to get there. Um, this is a little town of Castine, very uh, interesting town, very historic town. Um, if you're ever in this part of the world, I certainly recommend a visit. Well, we're going to be spending a visit today looking at some of the data in this area. Um, we've got some imagery here just for visual reference. I'm going to turn that off briefly. I'm going to turn on the point cloud, uh, the LiDAR data for this area. Um, now, as, he, as we said, as we introduced uh, during our agenda, the first bullet is basically defining the process of gridding. What exactly are we embarking on here? Kasti, um, Katrina, I don't know if you want to share some information on, on exactly what this process involves. Yeah, so, so far we've been working with the vector, the raw data for LiDAR. Um, so these are 3D point features. And if we zoom in a little bit here, we can just confirm that, um, remember exactly what we've been looking at so far. So I've got individual points here that are 3D features, and I could look at the attributes of one here. We see that it's a vector feature that's got some attributes associated with it. Um, so that type of layer doesn't always work with all of the applications that we want to do. And so the gridding process is going to turn this into raster data. So a raster representation where the pixel has a value associated with it. Um, in this case, we're mostly going to be looking at pixel values that have the elevation associated with the pixel. Um, as opposed to an image which would have RGB or color associated with it. Um, we're actually going to have height value. Um, and we'll also see some options for doing that with other numeric attributes. So it might not be just a height, but we might also use a grid for um, like the NDVI or some other things that we can take out of this data as well. Yeah, so essentially what we're doing is taking our, our raw material, and I think we've used that term in the past where LiDAR is a raw material that's not an end product. And in this case, the procedure that we're going to follow is transforming that 
to create a surface model. That surface model then obviously can be the basis for a lot of other procedures, contour generation, uh, various analysis uh, procedures. So this is that transformational phase where we're taking the LiDAR data, having I assume filtered it previously, cleaned it up, done whatever we needed to do, and now we're going to create a more useful uh, uh, product from that. So as I mentioned at the, at the uh, beginning, uh, one of the important processes is filtering. And again, without spending too much time, obviously if we have a LiDAR point cloud that has multiple classifications present, um, we don't want to create a surface that necessarily includes all of those. There may be occasions when you will. In fact, a little bit later in our, our presentation, we're going to actually talk about generating what's called a DSM, a surface model. But for most of you, I'm assuming that your primary, your primary interest is going to be terrain, bare earth, whatever you want to call it. So you'll want to remove the points that do not represent bare earth. I'm going to try to choose one randomly here and see if I can get a good example. This is a class two, that's a ground point. Let me see if I can grab another. This is a class one. So this would represent a, a point that we do not want to use for our gridding purpose, for our terrain gridding purpose. So obviously in order for our terrain to be accurate, we'll want to initiate a filtering process. And again, with the with apologies for those of you who have actually seen this procedure at length, this is the primary filtering tool in uh, for LiDAR using the LiDAR module toolbar. You'll see all of the classifications listed here. Um, you'll see ground number two. Easiest way to isolate ground is to initially turn all of the uh, classes off and then just turn on the ground. So that's that's basically the procedure you would follow. Now I'm going to revert back to the original because as you will see in a few minutes, this is not the only way you can do this. This is for my personal uh, workflows, this is what I like to do. I like to see what points I'm going to be working with before I grid them, but you can actually initiate the filtering process as you will see in a second when uh, Katrina shows us some of the options in the dialog box. You can do this actually in uh, the gridding uh, dialog box. So I'm going to enable on again. We'll click OK. I'm going to use my home button to zoom out to a wider area. And I think for just this first example, why don't we focus on what looks like a fairly open area over here, just to show you a couple of variations on the gridding process. So we're gonna take a look at a few different ways to create a surface model of this area, which is mostly an open, kind of an open field area here. So um, we'll see a few differences in the methods here. So in order to create my elevation grid, I can use our nice new uh, toolbar button here in the analysis toolbar. One thing I, I, I keep uh, forgetting, but there is an, also an option here at the layer level to initiate this process. Mm -hmm. You can see uh, for on the under the relatively new analysis submenu, you'll see grid. Now people often say, well, why is this repeated? This allows you to target a specific layer. Um, while you will see a, a filter dialog box in just a second, this if you choose this option, you know you're gridding just one of the layers in your in your overlay control center rather than uh, uh, assuming that you want to grid all of them. Sorry, Katrina, I uh, jumped in there. That's okay. So we're I'm just going to use the toolbar button here. So we also are going to confirm what layers right. we want to contribute to our terrain grid. So we could also exclude things at this point. Um, we will actually come back to working with 3D vectors combined with our LiDAR data um, a little bit later. But we're just going to look at the LiDAR point cloud for now. Okay, so let's go ahead and give this a name. So our first uh, attribute here is going to be a description. And since we're going to make a couple, I'm going to give them some intelligent names. We're going to start with a triangulated grid. So I'm just going to call this triangulated ground because we're going to create a surface model here. So I could specify my vertical units and this would do the conversion. So even though my LiDAR point cloud right now is stored in meters, if I wanted to, I could generate um, an elevation grid that is using feet as the units. Next comes my gridding method. Um, and this is probably remembering the last thing that we did. Um, we're gonna take a look first at triangulation. Um, so this can be done actually without the LiDAR module as well. We could do this with vector data in fact, in fact, it's the only option without the LiDAR module. You may notice, by the way, if you're not currently a LiDAR module user, that this dropdown is available to you. But if you try to initiate any of the non-triangulation methods, it will actually tell you that you need to activate that module for this to work. So it's a little tease in a way, I guess. And when we enable that method, actually, some of the options in this lower part of this dialog are going to change slightly. Yep. Um, so we'll have to talk about the differences when you're using binning. But for the triangulation, we 
Um, we're next we're going to decide if we want to filter our LiDAR data at all. Um, so in this case, we are going to create a, surface, a ground model. Um, so it might be a good idea to use just the ground classified points. It would be, I think essential. And this is, again, what I said a few minutes ago, where I, I would typically filter before um, uh, the gridding process is initiated, but you can obviously do it here as well. Same end result. It's exactly the same process. Before Katrina clicks OK, you'll notice this dialog box also gives you many, many other filtering options. While we are mostly concerned about that, that classification, specifically classification of ground, if you want to eliminate points that are not within uh, any of the other criteria, then absolutely do that. One to note, by the way, if those of you familiar with the, uh, with the process of collecting LiDAR, um, you may want to filter all but last. Um, we, we know that the ground points are always going to be the last return. It's very unlikely you'll get a ground point that's the first of, of two points, or first of three uh, returns, I should say. So sometimes just initiating that last is also a good option. The gridding process will do that for you uh, automatically, but sometimes it's a little bit of a sanity check to, to kind of go through this process uh, yourself. And then even if we were going to create a surface model, um, it would be a good idea to cut out noise points or anything else like that in our data that we wouldn't want to include in our final terrain. <clears throat> so for this case, we're going to use just the ground classified points. And like David said, as with other analysis tools in Global Mapper, if we had filtered visually first, that would be the data that would be processed. So that filter would automatically be applied. Um, but in our case, we're seeing everything, so we're going to just do it in the context of the uh, grid creation window. Um, and then next we can determine the resolution of our output terrain data. That's what grid spacing is going to do. So the default setting here is to automatically determine the spacing. So that's based on the distance between our ladder points and it will calculate that statistically. Um, we'll see when we switch to bidding we actually can specify just how many point spacings we want to use. Um, or we could manually specify a grid spacing. Yeah, you're basically you're defining the resolution, and, and yeah. very often that's a workflow requirement. Your client needs a one meter resolution. We're talking about horizontal resolution, terrain grid. You just enter the values in here, and that will do that automatically for you. Yep, and then the reason to use a statistic would be, you know, you want to be close to the resolution that you actually um, got from the LiDAR data. So you don't want to, you could create a, you know, a one centimeter resolution grid, but it wouldn't really be accurate. Well, you just got to yeah. create a much larger file for right. no, no additional benefit. <laughs> yeah, so you want to make sure you have the data back up whatever that resolution is. <clears throat> okay, so our next setting here is the no data distance criteria. So this is a slider. Um, and right now we have it set all the way over to loose. Um, and as we go towards the loose side, we're going to fill in areas that contain no uh, ground points since we filtered to just ground by interpolating some values. Um, so in this particular area, you can see that we sort of have a bunch of vegetated areas and I'm sure there's some, some holes in the ground data there. So by sliding this over towards loose, we're going to get full coverage there. Um, so we'll interpolate some ground values. And there's some discussion about what's the preferred method here. It really comes down to your own individual preference and your own individual requirements. Um, do you want areas of your raster surface to be null if there's no data there? Um, the loose setting, and it obviously it's a relative scale, it's not yes or no. Um, the loose setting will allow you to accommodate uh, basically on the assumption that if we removed whatever those unclassified points were, there would be a ground surface underneath, the tight does the opposite. The further towards tight, the more you'll see holes in your data based on uh, gaps in the point cloud. I think in this example, I think I'm going to bring it in a little bit. You'll find that sometimes if you move it slightly towards tight, it speeds up the processing just a little bit. So we'll move it over just a, a, a little bit. Um, so. There's a few checkbox options at the bottom that we can talk about as well. Um, if we had data that for some reason had zeros that we wanted to not include in our data set, um, I can't think of any particular reasons why there might be zeros in our point cloud. It's but. just errors in the data. There's some processes that will actually, if it does not recognize a valid elevation, will put a, a, a null zero. value, which yeah. is interpreted as zero. So yeah. Okay. So we're also um, in this process of triangulation. We're essentially connecting the um, existing LiDAR data with this triangulated network. Um, and we can also generate that as a vector file. Um, this is a fairly large file for um, LiDAR points because it's going to connect every single ground LiDAR point 
um, with lines. Yeah, and and every point, triangles. every point becomes every every lidar point becomes the corner of a triangle or the intersection of of triangles. So those triangles are three dimensional features that you can actually generate uh, as a vector layer. And for for again for some workflows, that is the output requirement is a tin rather than the raster surface. That certainly is an option here. Um, our next checkbox here again relates to the amount of interpolation that we're going to do. Um, so if we have an irregularly shaped point cloud. Um, checking this option would produce a square full, filled in um, raster rather than um, keeping it just inside of the bounding box of our data. Um, and finally, we can go right out to a file. So if we're creating this for a very large data set, um, you might want to just write it right out to a file rather than store it in the workspace. Um, if you were to save the workspace, and not have it saved anywhere else that can create some large workspace files. So we could go straight to um, a raster format, a terrain format, especially something that might have some compression. Um, and here, here we're writing out directly to Global Mapper Grid, which is our proprietary uh, elevation format. And I, I would say most workflows, you want to see the results of what you're doing before you do that. This is very much the exception. Yep. And again, based in situations where the, the volume of data just means that the rendering is taking a long time, you can have it basically perform two actions in one. So again, if we had very large data extent, we might want to consider some internal tiling here so we could split up the results into smaller sections. Those would produce um, smaller terrain grids. Um, I think we've covered that in a lot of other videos. Yeah, these, these are so, recurring tabs. You've yep. seen those in some of the analysis videos and even in uh, you know, some of the earlier videos in this, in this series, we talked about tiling and grid bombs, those recurring options. And for this particular example, uh, we're just going to look at the data that's currently on our screen. We're going to kind of speed up this processing here a little bit and just do it for our current screen downs. Um, and this, even if um, you know you, you do need a full result of the full data set, it's never a bad idea to, to take a look at a smaller area, something that processes nice and quick like this, just to see what you're getting um, with your settings if you're not sure. Yeah, and so what you're seeing on the screen now is the tinned version, and you may see depending on the resolution of your monitor, you may actually see the texture starting to come through here based on the point array. Um, we're going to take a look at this in the context of a comparison, basically. We're going to look at the binning process and what binning does. And there may be situations where you, you'll want the precision of a tin, basically you're factoring every point. Um, but as you'll see, the next workflow that we're going to do is, is a repeat workflow, but in this case, we're going to use the binning process. So I'm going to basically, I'm going to start driving here. I'm going to grab the mouse. I'm going to uh, go back into the same dialog box. We've been here before, confirming the layer that we're going to be working with. Click OK. And this time, we're going to change our uh, layer from uh, the triangulated to the binned version. So we'll call this binned ground, I guess. So binning, what we're talking about when we talk about binning is essentially uh, sample areas. We're going to define the extent of these sample areas within which Global Mapper is going to look for either the minimum, the maximum, or if necessary, the average uh, elevation. In this context, we're talking specifically about elevation. You'll see there are a few options in there that we can vary that quantifiable value that's used for our surface. But in our case, we're talking about terrain. So the benefits of this procedure a, you're going to get a smoother model. It's going to be uh, a, it's going to allow you to target very specifically within that defined area, a sample area, the lowest point. So if there are anomalies in your data, you can guarantee that that one point that's selected has a higher chance of being a ground point than maybe some of those that are surrounding that that are slightly higher. So we can, with more confidence, assume that it is actually an accurate ground model. The additional benefits are, are not as visible. It's a much faster process. You'll see that the, the processing time is virtually instantaneous. And, uh, and there's an aesthetic part as well. I mean, you'll see in a second when we look at our binned surface, it looks a little cleaner than what we're looking on the screen behind us now. Now, we don't have to go through every option as before. We'll just quickly go down uh, meters once again. We are generating a surface. Uh, sorry, to a bare earth surface. So we want to go with the DTM option. This is where I mentioned previously that we would have options for um, uh, average and uh, maximum as well. We'll get to maximum in our next workflow. We'll talk about a DSM, but for now it's a DTM. Um, the assumption here is that we're working with elevation, which in our case, it is the case where the, the specific attribute of our LiDAR data that we want to use for the, the gridding process is the Z value. 
Um, there are options in here to actually generate a raster surface from some of those other variables, things like the intensity value. Uh, you may have seen uh, one of our earlier presentations. We visualized the LiDAR data based on its intensity. Well, we can actually create a raster version of that um, that actually represents the intensity of the return. And it looks kind of like a black and white photograph as it did when we looked at the point cloud. We can generate a grid based on height above ground. If we have an NIR, near infrared, uh, value associated with each point, we can generate a NDVI or an NDWI grid. And finally, this is a fairly new one, we can actually generate a grid or a raster uh, layer that reflects the density of what my point, uh, the points in this point cloud. So multiple options here, obviously in our case, we're concerned about elevation values. And <laughs> once again, I often forget this point, we do need to filter. The filtering is, has been res reset. We've got a new layer, so it assumes we're going to go back to the start again. Clear all once again, limit the ground. So if you had applied that ground filter uh, to the visualization, then that, that would remember that we just want to work with ground. Which is a good reason, why, yeah. a good, good excuse why I often forget to do this, because I yeah. usually <laughs> will do that in the, uh, in the visual, yeah. visual context before. Because it is a good idea to do that, because you can see where there are higher concentrations of ground points. It gives you an indication as to you know, the source data, the visualization of the source data. Uh, point spacing, once again, is an option. Now, in this case, it's a little bit different. What we're doing by um, applying a multiple of the point spacing is defining the bin size. Now, if we actually explored the metadata for this layer, we could probably determine exactly what our point spacing is. And it's a, a um, multiple of that that would be the bin size. Or, once again, we can manually specify that by simply entering a value, in this case, in, in meters. That's my, my uh, unit of measure. I leave the default as it is, so it's going to be a uh, two times multiple of the point spacing. We'll leave our grid distance the same as it was before. You'll notice that the tin option is no longer an option. We're not actually uh, tinning this time, so that uh, vector uh, output is no longer an option, uh, nor is the option to um, constrain the gridding process inside the convex hull, because once again, that's part of this process. It goes along basically the extent of my full data set and generates those bins or analyzes those bins. So um, that is an, an automated process. We could, again, as before, export directly if necessary. So many of the settings are exactly the same. Um, we want to go to grid bounds once again and limit it once again to what's on our screen. Click OK. And I don't know if you set your stopwatch to the last one, but this was an instant process. It wasn't a, a large amount of time previously, um, but we did actually see the dialog box. This time it was virtually instantaneous. So as a result of that process, I'm going to turn the point cloud itself off we now have two variations on that layer. And you can see by simply turning off the binned version and looking at the underlying triangulated version, you can see there's very distinct changes in the pattern. With the binned version, it's quite easy to discern. This is actually a road, I believe. But when you um, enable the noise or you display the noise that's uh, a consequence of the triangulation, that's harder to discern. You can't actually see that road as clearly because there's so much, uh, again, noise within the point cloud. Another way of visualizing this is to use our image swipe tool. We've used this in, in again, in different contexts, but in this case, I'm simply gonna pull back the bin version to see what's underneath. And you can see even aesthetically, that layer that's sitting on top that I'm pulling back is a cleaner terrain model. A final way of visualizing this is actually to use our profiling tool. Um, this time uh, we've used our profiling tool in the context of uh, LiDAR within these, this uh, series. This time we're profiling terrain. And if I simply draw a cross-sectional view, um, one of the settings, actually I'll choose a, a different area here. Let me choose a shorter area, a little bit uh, more exaggerated. But what you're seeing here in the green cross-sectional view, as denoted by the red dashed line, is my binned version of my terrain data, and the, the blue is the tinned version. Again, extremely exaggerated here, but you can see it's very much uh, smoother when we go through the binning process. So that's basically looking at a, a larger neighborhood of points and looking for a statistic inside of that. Exactly. Kind of smoothing, out, smoothing out the data, removing some of that slight variation that's really kind of noise in the measurement. So in a, in a sense, you could describe that as the, kind of the final filtering process. Mm -hmm. You're filtering out the, the anomalies, filtering out uh, any noise that's in there. And again, depending on your requirements, tinning might be a requirement, but certainly from my point of view, binning is certainly a preferred method for generating that surface. And actually, since we're looking at this data, just a little bit of a, 
a note about the um, no data distance. If we look at the triangulated, you can really see here. So the, here's where some of our trees were, and you can see that that filling of the gap. So that's interpolating those values um, right in. And it's pretty distinct with the triangulation. It's also happening with the binning method in a little bit smoother of a way. But um, that's where we would, if we had gone all the way to the tight, we would have no data in those locations where those bushes were. So the area we selected for this is a fairly open area. I think if I turn my imagery on, you'll find it's actually a golf course, I believe. Yeah, we, we chose the, uh, the seventh hole of the golf course here to do our analysis. <laughs> uh, I'm going to change and look at a different location. Now, the way I'm going to do this is actually using a tool that I find myself using increasingly uh, when I want to record a location. We have a, an option to uh, name and save a view and restore that name view. So to help us today to find where we should be, I have a a pre-configured view called DSM, um, it will take me to that location. And obviously you can see this selected location is much more uh, forested. And we're gonna use this uh, to generate that variation, the DSM as opposed to the DTM. Let me turn off the imagery for now. We'll turn on our point cloud once again. And I, think I walked through here. I think this is Witherly Woods. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, very, very much. So worth. this is a forested area. It is very much a forested area, and you'll notice leaf, leaf on as well. So we're getting a lot of uh, a lot of returns from the the foliage. So, um, so we're gonna look at the same process again here, um, but also add in creating a surface model. So this would be, um, especially in this case, the top of the canopy. Um, is what we're looking at. So there's a lot of analysis tools um, that might be used for this type of data. It might, it might be worthwhile before we actually embark on this to take a quick cross-sectional view of the raw uh, LiDAR data. And you can see the, the, uh, what we're going to be identifying here. We've obviously got ground fairly well represented. It looks like they're orange in this case. And we have additional points. Now, the objective in, in our first exercise was very specifically to identify ground. Uh, we were uh, we removed basically anything that was above ground through a couple of different processes, initially filtering and then using the binning process to ensure that we just got ground. Here, um, procedure's gonna be different, so. So let's go ahead and go back to our elevation creation dialog. And again, we're just gonna work with the LiDAR point cloud. So this time we're gonna create, I'm gonna call this canopy model. And this time we want to use the maximum value. So we're gonna create a surface model that is the top of the canopy in this area. So within the sample areas where previously we looked for the lowest possible elevation, now we're looking for the highest. Yep, and we're gonna stick with, um, I think the same settings here. Um, and again, we want to look at just the data on our screen. We're just gonna do a smaller area. Anything else you want to talk about here, David? I think. I think we're. Uh, we, yeah, I think uh, one thing we're not doing here, which is noteworthy, is we're not filtering. So we don't want to apply any filters. It's quite possible that some of the maximum values may be ground points in areas which are fairly open. In fact, I think we may see that. So we don't actually need to apply any filtering yeah. in this context. Unless you wanted to remove noise. So if you had classified right. noise, um, you would want to make sure that if, it, if you didn't delete it in that process Correct. that you got rid of those noise points. We, I don't think we have any noise. It, just in context, this, this point cloud only has two classifications. It's only got uh, ground and unclassified. So obviously that's not relevant in our case, but yeah. So let's go ahead and run that. So this is our canopy model now. So the tops of the trees and you can pretty clearly see um, those individual tree features there. Um, and we could compare this to a, a bare earth model yeah, of the could, same location. We could do exactly the same thing again, going with D, DTM again. We're obviously yeah, getting so a we're gonna little bit repetitive here going through the same dialogue box. Step through this a little bit quicker here. Let's call this one oh, bare earth of the same area. Um, and this time we do want to filter again. So we're going to use just the ground. So that's in addition to in the local neighborhood bin, we're looking at the minimum value. So we're trying to... Uh, it's the minimum of the ground points in yep. this case. So we're trying to cut out... Um, that's kind of a second filter to get the lowest value there. And we'll look at just our current screen bounds. Great. So then we can look at these two in cross-section. And just to make sense of this, I'll switch the order here so the canopy is on top. <clears throat> And let's turn off our point cloud. Wow. So quite quite clear to see here. The blue line represents the 
what would be the underlying layer in the overlay control center, which is our DTM, our ground model. And what's in green and what's outlined in red is our surface. So it's very clearly outlining the tops of the trees. So a surface model might also include uh, buildings as well. So we, we picked a forested area here, but... Yep. Um, and we could also visualize this in 3D as well if yep. we wanted to show multiple terrain surfaces. Yeah, that's right. Um, one thing to note, that Katrina closed the window very quickly, but there were, there were locations where the DTM and the DSM are very close. Obviously areas where there's breaks in the forest, where there are no trees, where the, the surface and the terrain uh, are um, correspond with each other. So. So we're going to take a look at a couple more cases here um, with some of our new functionality that was added in 18.2. I'm just going to give this a quick uh, context here. Um, you can see there's definite holes in the data here. And the reason for that, by the way, I should have pointed this out, is if I can find my imagery, these look like probably retaining ponds or something, like uh, obviously hydro features. So there's obviously no data here. now. Uh, Katrina is actually going to go through a couple of workflows, the first of which is going to be using the same procedure we used before. How does Global Mapper, how does the gridding process deal with this in its raw form? And then one of the tools we've just introduced to, to correct this. So. so if we were to create a um, terrain model from the surface, um, just using the same settings that we've been using, we'll, we'll take a look at what that does first. Um, so this is... What could we call this layer? We call this uh, raw, <laughs> raw terrain. This is just for comparison purposes. Raw terrain, there we go. By the way, one of the things I, I advocate for in my training classes and presentations is the importance of making sure your layers are named correctly. So I think Katrina's <laughs> doing a very good job with that today. So what we're going to be looking at in a minute is this new setting here for um, using break lines. So this would involve um, taking 3D area or line features and including them when you generate your terrain data. Um, in this case, we're going to look at just what happens when we have large holes in our data, um, just with the triangulation that's going to happen here. And we'll pull that loose all the way over so we can actually see this. Yep, so if I set this all the way to loose, we're going to interpolate all the way into this open space to fill in that holes with kind of an estimate of the terrain height. Right. Um, and we will see what that does. And let's also constrain this again to the current screen bounds. So this is the result of our raw um, settings kind of interpolating into those values. So all along the edge of that pond, it's going to take those elevation values and triangulate towards the center, basically to fill in those holes. It's very difficult to, to distinguish anything in there. So if you, if you were interested in any you know, hydro features, you're obviously not getting any value from that process. You're also corrupting your ground. Uh, there was no filtering performed here, obviously, but you're, you're generating a corrupted ground model because you have uh, that interpolated version of the, the hydro surface. So this happens a lot with water features where either you get no returns or maybe you get kind of sporadic returns sometimes from the bottom of right. the That's river, sometimes rivers, yeah. off the surface. It can be a little bit conflicting in what it reflects. Um, and there can also be a lot of noise sometimes in the river. So you can get some pretty interesting terrain results yeah, um, yeah. along major water features. Um, so this new option is going to let us um, essentially burn that flat area height into our terrain grid um, to correct some of this errors that we know are going to happen in water features. So let's generate this one more time. I'm going to go ahead and turn on um, the pond vector features that we have. So these are vectors outlining each of the areas. And let's use the info tool and take a look at um, what attributes they have. So each of them has a height associated with them. Um, in this particular case, we just have a single height for the whole area feature. We could, if we wanted to, have more of an inclined plane here and have different per vertex heights, that would work as well. So th these are obviously pre-configured and pre-created outlines of the ponds. You can see that elevations are slightly different for each one. This is a yep, so we've got a few different elevations here. And uh, people often say, well, how do I define that? It, sometimes contouring will work. You can actually generate a whatever the, the bank, the, the contour is, if you have a terrain model already there, to define the extent of your hydro feature. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of... Um, data available, you know, the National Hydrography data set, lots of things out there. Um, and if you're working in the US, you know, the 10 meter dam can be a good way to get, you know, some data that you might use for this to compare to your higher resolution. Yep. Um, okay, so let's perform this one more time. 
So this time we want to include the vector data in our layer selection. So this is by default choosing the layers that I have turned on in my control center. Um, and that is what I want to use. So that's a nice little shortcut there. But otherwise we could choose um, some other existing vectors to include. Um, so this is looking for 3D vectors. Uh, the height needs to be a absolute elevation value um, and not a height above ground. And this is going to be our uh, hydro flattened terrain. So again, we're going to do uh, a bare earth model, so the digital terrain model. And I want to filter to just the ground. And you can see because I have some 3D vector features here, it has automatically checked this option to use 3D area or line features as break lines. Um, so that is going to burn these 3D area features into my terrain grid. And we also have a setting here as to how um, far beyond that vector feature we're going to go um, to do some interpolation back to what the LiDAR point returns were. Um, so this is in number of pixels or samples. Um, those come out as the same thing. Um, so uh, theoretically then if this value is low you'll get a steeper transition between what we know is the consistent elevation of the lake surface and what's in, uh, generated from the point cloud. So if you want a, a more gradual keep this number larger. So putting a 2 in here will give us a, a, a slightly less <coughs> steep slope I guess. Yeah, so we're just going to do a little bit of transition. So 2 pixels beyond the edge of my area I'm going to ignore the LiDAR data and I'm just going to do a nice smooth interpolation to meet the LiDAR point values um, beyond that. It's kind of like a buffer really um, that we're using for interpolation. And you can see the results now. Uh... Uh, burned into the terrain. You can see now the flattened area. I think probably the best way to see that. I think our info tool is still active. Let me deselect. Oops, sorry. Um, using our profile once again, um, you can see obviously this is now a flat surface. You'll also see the slopes or the, the banks, if you like, that were defined, very cleanly defined here. So we knew the surface of the water level. We derived our, our ground model. I should have turned my LiDAR points off, but we derived our ground model uh, from the ground points in the in the uh, point cloud, but we overrode those um, with the interior area of the lake being defined by the Z value in the uh, polygon itself. So very precise flat surface. And we can actually compare that to uh, the other version if we turn that on as well. So let's do that cross section one more time and take a look at the differences. Oh yeah, so you can see the, the blue line once again uh, indicating what what was interpreted as ground before we went through the process of uh, uh, flattening. This is pretty exaggerated, but yeah, we had, you know, some not smooth surface of our water, which would normally be pretty flat yep. on the surface. So in the next workflow, we're going to continue with this idea of essentially overriding the terrain. Um, in the last example, we used obviously polygons to create a localized grid that we integrated or burned into the surrounding terrain. I'm going to do a similar process now, except uh, we're going to base that on a linear feature. I'll just quickly turn on the line in question. This is represents, represents a stream channel. It's actually selected here. There we go. There's my stream channel. This is a 3D line. Um, obviously, it's now sitting on the point cloud. We're going to generate our grid, and in the area surrounding the line, we're going to override the elevation values from the, the LiDAR data and basically uh, create what we call, or it's basically derived from a break line. We're going to force the stream channel to follow uh, the elevations that are in the line feature. Um, once again, we're going to do a control workflow first, like a before and after. Um, in this example, for this particular workflow, what we're doing is generating a watershed. And in order to initiate this, I've created a single point. And that point is essentially going to represent the target point for my watershed delineation. Uh, ultimately, what I want to generate is a single polygon feature that encompasses the full extent of drainage to this point. This is a, a scenario we've worked on in, in different contexts. Um, uh, for things like uh, regulating uh, activity when it comes to water, so, um, drinking water supply, things like that. So um, same procedure. First thing I want to do is select that point. Um, then I would generate my watershed 
to, again, delineate the, the catchment area. Let's get to that in a few minutes. First thing we're going to do is create a raw grid. Same process as we did before. We're going to go through this pretty quickly using my gridding function, confirming that the target layer is our Castine LiDAR layer. Um, we'll leave the settings as they were, maybe give it a slightly better name. We'll call this one raw watershed. So, sorry, raw. Let's try that one more time. Raw water shed. I'm trying to type to the side here, so it's a little difficult. And everything else should be the same. We'll make sure we filter. We just want our ground model once again. So we'll isolate our class to our ground points. Um, let's change the grid spacing. Previously, we used a, a, a multiple of our average point spacing. Now we're going to do a manual pr process. We're going to make that a meter spacing. Um, we've pulled our loose tight in just a little bit from previous. We'll leave that where it is as well. And finally, as before, we will just limit this uh, gridding process to what we see on our screen. And we'll click OK. So this is a coastline here. So we've got in our bottom right corner, there are a lot of ocean area that has no LiDAR returns. So that is part of why you want a, a little bit um, tighter of a setting there so we don't try to interpolate the ocean. Exactly, exactly. So here's, here's our, again, our raw data. You can immediately see now that we've processed this point cloud, one of the issues that we're going to encounter here. The, the drainage pattern is fairly well vis fairly visible here, but you can see it actually crosses one road, two roads. Now, in order to delineate our watershed, there may be some impact from the fact that these roads are obviously a little bit higher than the surrounding area. In fact, if I turn on some imagery here, we'll cheat a little bit. Um, you'll see, oh, let me drag this in my overlay control center right to the top, that's fine. And you'll see that imagery now, quite clearly here, that drainage, that little drainage stream um, it goes under a culvert. So we, I can anticipate when I try to create a watershed based on the point that I had uh, created previously, that we may have some issues. Once again, I'll, I'll move that point to the top. I've adjusted my behavior, by the way, so that um, my layering uh, um, is based on A, the top of the overlay control center has the layered on top. Also, the rules apply to the different vector features. I've overridden though, that's a configuration option. That's why I'm moving layers around to ensure that they're on top of the map. So again, first thing I'm gonna do here is, oh, I've got my lighter on. Let me turn that off first. We selected way more points than we needed. This is the point of origin for my analysis. Again, I wanna delineate uh, drainage to this point. Our watershed tool can be accessed using the uh, watershed button in the toolbar. Uh, just a couple of settings here, defining our, our stream cell count. This allows us to establish a threshold, a minimum threshold value of for an area that will be defined as, as a single drainage system. A um, couple of checkboxes here are checked by default because I have a point selected. I want to uncheck the flow from option. That would be a water drop analysis, and that's not what we're doing in this case. But what we want to do instead is show drainage to a point point having been selected. Um, the threshold allows us to determine uh, the extent of analysis outside of the specific point location. If I haven't placed a point right at the bottom of the stream, stream channel, in other words, it will accommodate a multiple of five times the resolution to look for the stream channel in that vicinity. Um, if you're following this yourself or going through this procedure, one of the checkboxes, is, which is checked by default, is this idea to create areas. I've unchecked that in my case. Um, not really relevant for what we're doing right now. And the final setting I want to address, and perhaps the most important, is this depression fill depth. Global Mapper's watershed analysis tool has been set up by default to accommodate the fact that there may be anomalies in the data. And based on this threshold value, it will artificially fill in a depression to ensure flow through a lower area. Now, the lower you make this value, the more uh, localized depressions will be respected. So in my case, I'm gonna keep this fairly low. I'm gonna type in a value of 0.5 meters, 50 centimeters. So anything that's below 50 centimeters in, in terms of its threshold will be filled in to allow continued flow. Anything that's over that, will result in a termination of my watershed. Now with my fingers crossed here, oh, well, final setting my watershed bounds again, uh, will limit it to what's on the screen. Um, again, with fingers crossed, what I'm gonna do is select okay. I'm assuming in this workflow that when it encounters the road, which is obviously an elevated area that's a little bit higher than our 0.5 meters, it, the watershed will not be allowed to continue. So we'll click okay, and we'll let it go through the process. And the result will be a pink shaded polygon. And you can see in this example where on the image, it was quite clear there was a drainage 
that flows through this area, you can see right here it terminates. And that's because of that threshold value. It resumes on the other side of the road. And it, once again, it terminates right here. It looks like there is a little bit of a lower area. So it is finding some of the catchment, but certainly not the majority of that catchment area. So once again, this first workflow based on this raw data creates a watershed or creates a, a, a catchment area that is not complete. So how do we rectify that? Well, going back to our raw data, let me turn off a couple of layers here. The catchment area I just created, we probably should have named that differently, but we'll create a second version of that in just a second. Um, if I turn on my point cloud once again, and also turn on this stream that I referenced previously, this stream has embedded elevation values. This is a three dimensional line feature. So along the course of this stream, we're going to derive our elevation model from these values, including uh, in those areas where it actually crosses the road. Uh, it, it'll basically create a culvert as the, the process. So I want to repeat what I did before. Um, I, again, I've got my uh, point select. I don't really need to do that yet. We're going to generate our terrain surface first. We'll go back and generate a second uh, watershed in just a few minutes. But I'm going to generate a terrain surface. Um, I'm not interested in the watershed point. That's my little dot over here. We'll turn that off. But we are going to use both the point cloud as well as the stream. Those are the two components of this combined grid that's going to be generated. Same settings as previous. Once again, clear all, just ground. And um, point spacing, again, we'll go back to one meter point spacing as we did in our first example. What we do need to address this time, as we did with our pond scenario, is the idea of defining our soft edge. In other words, our buffer around the line. Um, the smaller the value, the steeper the size of the channel will be. So we're going to leave this as at two samples. In other words, two times the average resolution, which is or two, two times the grid spacing, which is defined as one meter. So this will obviously be a two meter buffer either side of that line. Yeah, so especially with linear features, um, that's where you might want to set a distance there. So our line might represent something that in the real world is wider than um, you know, just a single pixel. Exactly, exactly. So now again, v knowing that this reflects the value that's uh, defined as a grid spacing here, you can do a little math here and ours is very easily two times one is two in this case. Um, grid bounds, once again, just limiting it to what's on my screen. I think everything else should be fine. Um, give, give it a, it a little bit lo more logical name. What did we call the last one? Uh, Raw watershed. So this is the improved watershed. Improved watershed. <laughs> You're giving me big words to type here. Improved watershed or break line watershed might be work as well. Improved watershed. And we'll click OK. And exactly the same process as before. It's generating our surface. And you should see a visual distinction. We'll use our image swipe in just a second here when it finally calculates that watershed. Uh, most visible right here, where my cursor is located at, and indeed right here as well. Those road crossings are now very well defined. Although it doesn't represent actual terrain, I wouldn't use this type of procedure for contouring, for instance, because we're creating an artificial culvert for the purpose of watershed analysis specifically. Now we've had many questions about this procedure. You know, uh, when a watershed enter, or when a, a drainage system enters, for instance, a pipe, how do we accommodate that? This is a tool that you can now perform a uh, complete watershed, even for features that are not sitting on top of the terrain. Um, I, again, I'll quickly use my um, image swipe, making sure that the original layer is still turned on. Uh, raw watershed, there we go, right there. So it's sitting underneath right now using my image swipe tool. We'll pull one back and we'll see the difference between the two. It's quite subtle. Obviously, for most of the area, the process is exactly the same. But you'll see when I'm pulling it back, you can see a very well defined stream channel has now been burned into the terrain using that line feature that we created. And so that um, distance setting too that we set is kind of the width of that stream yeah. channel. So and we're interpolating kind of the banks of the stream yeah, based on that setting. So you very clearly defined here where you can see it's actually nicely burned in. So repeating the process again, my fingers are well, well and truly crossed here. Let me move my watershed point to the top once again, uh, making sure that we're using our improved watershed this time. I'll turn my point cloud off. Um, we don't need our stream anymore for this. The stream, the function of that linear feature was specifically uh, to generate that localized, locally modified terrain. Um, now with my, turn off my image swipe tool and grab my digitizer, uh, we'll grab the point once again and repeat exactly the workflow that we did before. Um, same settings as before, we're not tracing flow from in this case, uh, we're tracing flow to. 
um, resolution is the same. Um, the depression fill depth, again, will revert back to 0 0.5. And our watershed bounds, just what's on my screen. Um, uh, and we want to give this a better name, maybe something about the culvert. <laughs> culvert catchment area, <laughs> to distinguish it. There, culvert catchment area. And we'll click OK. And hopefully, you will see that what was previously constrained to a very small area based on these uh, b barriers, these roads, now we can see where these culverts have been delineated with this brake line. The watershed is a much more accurate model of the drainage to that point. So in the final section, we're going to take a look at some of the visualization options. The intent of this, this section of this presentation was to talk about that transition from a a raw point cloud into a terrain surface. And obviously we could go to you know lengths about in, in terms of describing some of the procedures we could follow, contouring. We did a little bit of watershed, but we could also do things like view shed, volume calculations. That's not uh, for this presentation, unfortunately. We have other uh, webinars and webcasts where we cover those workflows. But one thing I did want to cover today was some of the initial visualization options. We have created a raster layer. Um, we typically think of raster, raster data as imagery, but it's way more than imagery. This is a gridded surface that allows us to represent the data in a, a, a visual context. Now, what you're seeing here with this surface, and we've zoomed out obviously to the full extent of the town here, um, is a shader pattern that has applied a color to each pixel. And it's an interpolated visualization so that you can see, we obviously have some anomalies in our data because my legend goes from minus 20 here. Um, all the way to 67 meters. The colors, of, as you can see, represent that. This is a shader. There are a number of shaders that are pre-configured in Global Mapper that let you change how the pixels are displayed with a gridded layer. Uh, for instance, we have what we call a global shader. Now, if I choose that option, it appears that my visualization is, is just a single color, but in fact, it's a shader pattern that could be applied globally. The, the values are consistent with actual elevations. And so within a local context here in this town, there's not a great deal of elevation range, only up to about 67 meters. That's why I'm not seeing a lot of change. If you kind of squint a little bit, you can see it changes ever so slightly, but not much. I think we found our anomalies you in our did data find too. Your anomalies. Something <laughs> Another is, case for hydro flattening maybe. Need some investigation going on here. Something's mm -hmm. going on in the uh, north part of town here. Um, so again, just another example of a shader. This is one that um, will be consistent regardless of the uh, extent of the data. So you can do comparisons between different parts of the world. The same shader pattern will be applied to specific elevations. The Atlas shader, by the way, the previous one, is scaled to the loaded data. So the color range from blue through red will reflect whatever elevation range is present. Um, a couple of very specific ones I want to show, slope shader. It's almost a tongue twister. Slope shader. Slope shader is a visualization of the data not reflecting actual elevation, but reflecting the angle of the slope. This is great for doing an initial analysis, maybe for a, an engineering project or for uh, some sort of uh, landscape pr procedure. One of the thing, interesting things in this is it very clearly delineates a very interesting uh, a man-made feature in the middle of town here. This is a fort. I believe it was built during the Revolutionary War. Don't quote me on that, but it, it's a very old fort in the context of, of the United States. And you can see it quite clearly delineated because the, the embankments are quite steep. So you can see that a, a, with a darker shade. Also over here on the, uh, on the west side, you can see it's a slightly steeper slope than it is over here on the right. So this is a visualization based on angle. My legend reflects that as well. You can see it's a degree value rather than an actual elevation value. I think you might be able to see the picture mound in there too. There is actually Just a slightly. baseball field in the middle of the fort. Yeah, you can actually see a little bit of slope around uh, the outfield of the baseball field that they put inside the, uh, inside the fort. Um, one other slope variation is a slope direction shader. Now, this is a little bit confusing when you take a quick glance at it, but if you look at the legend, you'll see that colors are now being applied that reflect um, not slope angle, but slope bearing. North facing slopes would be top and bottom, right. zero or 360 would be white. South facing slopes, which here in the Northern Hemisphere, most of us are probably most interested in south facing slopes, you can see those would be the reddish colors. Now, with all of the colors present, it, it's not that easy to, to figure out what's going on. One of the things we can do if we had more time, we could uh, show you in the configuration dialog box how we can change uh, the slope visualization 
uh, to just show the south facing slopes. So everything else would be left a null color. And that's probably a more useful use of this north facing, obviously, if you're in the southern hemisphere. So those are just some of the examples of the shaders. Um, there is an option to create your own as well. Um, I encourage you, if you're getting, if you're feeling artistic, to spend some time and build your own custom shader. You can apply colors to specific elevations. You can have those intermediate elevations interpolated between your assigned colors. So you can basically customize the display of any gridded data to your own requirements. Yeah, and you can also access those slope values to make a custom slope shader or slope direction shader. Exactly, yeah. it could be based on elevation or slope. Now one final thing we will show here in, in regards to uh, to terrain visualization, I'll go back to the Atlas shader, which is by the way the default and it is the most common visualization of, of terrain. But one final thing to show is a, a little button here which is adjacent uh, to the, the drop down. And this is our hill shading. What we're looking at on the screen is actually a terrain model with shadows accentuated. And if I simply uncheck that box, you can see it drops those shadows out. In a way, it makes it a little more difficult to see what's going on. There is an argument to be made that's actually a purer model. You're not actually being artificially fed the shadows so you can see the raw data itself. But certainly from a uh, an aesthetic point of view, when you have that hill shade on, it certainly allows the terrain to, to jump out at you. You can see a lot more clearly. So many of those settings can be config configured by the way the angle of the shadows, etc., the intensity of the shadow, our configuration options. If you open up the configuration dialog box, there's an entire section where you can customize that shader pattern. So our objective today was to take a look at gridding LiDAR data. Um, so we talked a little bit about exactly what the gridding process was, creating a surface from our vector data. Um, and we also revisited filtering, so, and we sort of repeatedly did that in the context of the actual terrain analysis, but we could also do that visually um, with the ladder module filters, and that would get applied um, automatically as well. Um, we took a look at a couple of different uh, gridding options, triangulation and binning methods. And I think laterally we actually exclusively used the binning method for all of the uh, the, the latter workflows when we're doing our hydro flooding, etc. So yeah. Um, and we looked at some of the other options in that dialogue, including the um, interpolation distance, that no data distance, how far you're going to um, calculate the value when you don't have known elevation points. Um, and then we looked at a new functionality for 18.2, which is um, break lines or hydro flattening um, that we can use to burn into our uh, ladder data while we're doing the binning process. Um, so that does uh, there is an option to actually access that with tinning as well, but it is a bit different. Um, and then finally, we looked at some terrain visualization as well. And as, as always, uh, if you have questions about any of the content that uh, Katrina and I share today, feel free to send an email to the folks at geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com. If you're watching this on YouTube, um, I will put this information in the description right below so you can see the email address there as well. Um, if you're not currently using Global Mapper and you would like to find out more about you know, the pricing, the licensing options, the folks at the, in the sales department uh, would be more than happy to answer your questions, orders at bluemarblegeo.com. And finally, once again, we, we remind those of you who are maybe looking at this video not having used the software before, there is a free trial. You can download the software right from our website, activate a trial for a couple of weeks and put it through its paces. Um, if you're currently using Global Mapper but not the LiDAR module, um, go into the Help menu, uh, Module License Extension Manager, you'll see the LiDAR module listed in there. Simply check the box, and again, you can request a trial, a two-week trial of the module itself. So again, options for you to try out some of the technology that uh, we saw today. So Katrina, thank you once again for joining me and for helping me today, keeping me uh, on task. Uh, we will be back next month um, our next uh, time around with our final LiDAR processing workflow, which is going to be exporting LiDAR data, variations on the theme of exporting.